It was early May, a perfect warm spring morning when the screaming began. I was picking up my mail from outside my secluded cabin in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina. The noise cut through the serene atmosphere with alert brutality. Help! Can anyone hear me? Please! I dropped the envelopes on the ground and sprinted in the direction of the plea, fearing that someone may be in grave danger. As I followed the desperate cries for help, I stumbled into a clearing where I found Sophie Haley, an acquaintance who lived a mile down from me frantically waving for my attention. Her clothes were ripped and her face was streaked with blood and tears. Oh, Robert, thank God you're here! She cried as she dashed towards me, her eyes fraught with terror. That scream! What happened? I asked, trying to steady her. It was Charlie! Something got him! She stammered, struggling to catch her breath and convey the chilling incident. I urged her to sit down and fill me in with any details she remembered. We had always suspected there were bears or wolves roaming around and passing through our neck of the woods. Charlie had been Sophie's German shepherd, a loyal friend to both of us. Sophie described a horrifying scene where Charlie suddenly whimpered before being snatched by some unseen force so violently that it left behind only tufts of fur and blood splatters on their porch. Her eyes shone with terror as she struggled to visualize anything more than a shadowy figure disappearing into the forest. I don't know what it was, but never have I seen something moving so fast, she whispered. I helped Sophie go back to her cabin while trying to pacify her fears. I couldn't hide my own anxiety about what we could be dealing with. This wasn't anything I had ever encountered before. After making sure she was safe in her cabin and had calmed down, I decided to follow the trail that led into the forest. I wanted to uncover at least a glimpse of whatever had taken Charlie, as it had terrified Sophie. The forest felt heavy with suspense, and the further I ventured, the more oppressive it grew. As Beethoven Woods lived up to its name, I stumbled upon a ghastly scene. A torn-apart camping tent surrounded by the scattered belongings of some unlucky campers. I noticed tattered clothes stained with fresh blood and claw marks gouged into nearby trees. My heart dropped at the sheer force with which those trees were torn apart. Hey Bob, are you there? Over, I heard through the walkie-talkie on my belt. I picked it up, relieved to hear a friendly voice. James, you hear me? Something bizarre is happening in Beethoven Woods. Over. I recounted my findings to James Harley, a law enforcement officer and close friend for years, skipping any gory detail. The silence on the other end was interrupted with disbelief, followed by a sigh. I don't know what we're dealing with, but let me help. Stay put. I'll be right there, he said before signing off. After what felt like hours but was barely twenty minutes, I heard rustling in the bushes and saw James and his K-9 unit mate Rex emerge. Old Rex here should be able to track whatever creature did this, James said as he surveyed the area with concern in his eyes. We followed Rex, who led us around in circles for a while until he stopped and growled at a nearby tree line. A heavy stench filled my nostrils, making me gag. Decomposition and decay lingered in the air. We should go back. I warned James, feeling an ominous foreboding that sent chills through my body, despite being damp from sweat. James nodded, but before we could retreat, we heard an unnerving growl echoing from the depths of Beethoven Woods. It wasn't a bear or a wolf, it was otherworldly. We stared at each other, dreading settling in as we both knew we were now in the territory of a dangerous predator. Without warning, Rex let out a distressing howl and lunged towards the growling source, disobeying his training and instincts to protect us, much to our dismay. James's radio crackled to life, and Sophie's voice trembled with terror. Robert, James, whatever it is, it's back, and it's coming for you. Get out of there now! Sophie screamed through the radio. I looked at James, and we both felt terror grip our hearts as we realized the danger we were in. We grabbed our gear and started sprinting back towards the ranger station, with Rex barking furiously somewhere behind us. As we made our way through the woods, I knew we needed help, but something inside me halted the call. Maybe it was fear of sounding ridiculous, or perhaps not knowing if anyone would believe us. But without any more thought, I yelled to James to call for backup. He grabbed his radio, his voice shaky but firm. We need immediate assistance at Beethoven Woods. There's some creature attacking us. The only response was static. We continued running, 
but I could hear the growling and rustling of leaves getting closer. It was gaining on us. The creature lunged out from the trees and tackled Rex, who yelped before falling silent. Rex! I shouted, heartbroken but unable to stop running. We finally reached a clearing near an old abandoned cabin. James and I glanced at each other before rushing inside, locking the door behind us. A series of loud bangs hit the wooden walls as the creature tried to break into the cabin where we were hiding. A brief moment after that, it seemed to be gone for a while. Slowly, we peered out the window and saw it, standing tall on two legs with elongated arms that nearly touched the ground. Its eyes were a sickly yellow color that seemed to pierce through us despite being far away from where we stood in terror. In a desperate attempt to fight off this beast, or at least protect ourselves until backup arrived, we frantically searched for anything useful within the cabin, amongst the scattered belongings left behind by previous occupants long gone from this place. Suddenly, the creature charged straight towards the cabin. The door burst open, revealing the beast with bloodied fangs and claws ready to tear us apart. As its large hand reached for James, he managed to block the attack with an old piece of wood that he found within the cabin. The sharp crack of splintering wood filled the room as James pushed back against the creature that brought unbearable terror and dread into our lives. I jumped forward making use of a heavy glass ashtray and smashed it against the beast's face on impulse. The blow seemed to disorient it only temporarily. Fearful for our lives but reluctant to give up, James and I tried to hold this horrifying beast back as best we could with anything we found within the fragile safety of this small cabin. At that precise moment, a gunshot rang through the air, followed by a high-pitched howl from the creature. Backup had finally arrived. Sophie must have managed to get our message across and summoned help from multiple nearby units. The creature stumbled back into the woods, blood dripping from its wound, as multiple officers continued firing their weapons at its retreating figure. James and I slumped onto the floor of the cabin, our breathing heavy and our adrenaline subsiding as we began processing what had just taken place. Looking around, we noticed legible fits of text etched near unreadably into one of the walls in what appeared to be human handwriting. Previous victims of this horror seemed to have left their desperate marks as well. As we tried to recover in that dark cabin, we remembered Rex, our brave, furry companion who sacrificed himself in order to protect us without station or formality. Indeed, his memory would bear heavily upon us for as long as we lived. From that day forward, Beethoven Woods became off-limits to everyone except official personnel, trying yet failing to locate and capture whatever horrible entity was lurking in their depths. Despite numerous reports and investigations, the creature was never found, nor was anyone who knew anything about it. Yet to us, those who had faced its torments, it remained a haunting reality that would forever overshadow our once tranquil lives. One thing became clear. Whoever or whatever this gruesome beast was, we were not prepared to face it, nor could we understand the depth of terror it brought forth into all our waking hours. It happened back in October of 2003, I was hiking with three friends through the dense woods of Pennsylvania. We had planned this trip for months, eager to get away from our mundane lives and breathe in that crisp autumn air. I remember joking with my buddies as we began our hike about strange events happening on camping trips I'd heard about, just to lighten the mood. As we walked deeper into the forest, I felt something I couldn't quite explain, a creeping unease that soon turned into a gripping fear. Even so, I tried to focus on the beauty of the trees and their vibrant reds and oranges. My friend Tyson stopped suddenly next to a tree and stared at something on its trunk. The rest of us gathered around him and saw, to our astonishment, three deep gashes slashing through the bark. Elliot, always the prankster, tried to make light of it by mumbling something about this being Bigfoot's favorite tree scratcher. When Tyson inspected them more closely, he began jokingly hypothesizing that these were not ordinary scratches, but marks left by a bear or some other wild animal. None of us believed that theory. Bears were scarce in this part of Pennsylvania. And besides, those gashes seemed too deliberate. We continued walking deeper into the forest until we found a suitable campsite near a clear stream. It was late afternoon when we finally set up our tents, laughing and chatting about everything under the sun. 
A few miles from our campsite, there was an abandoned cabin among the trees. We'd seen pictures of it online, and it seemed like an interesting spot to explore. As we reached its dilapidated structure, all conversation ceased. The cabin exuded an eerie silence that felt sinister in nature. While standing there, Richie suggested that we split up and may be able to find some relics or remnants from whoever lived in that cabin before. I ventured inside with Tyson while Elliot and Richie continued their search outside. This turned out to be a bad idea. The interior of the cabin was dusty and musty, but what got my heart racing was the smell of blood, thick, iron-rich, and nauseating. Cautiously making our way through the dark space, we noticed one room with a slightly ajar door. In that room we discovered something that would haunt me for the rest of my life, a scene so vile and grotesque that it still sends shivers through my body as I recall it. Tyson gagged and stumbled backward, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from the sight before us, a mangled mess of flesh and bone. It appears to be... Tyson glanced at me nervously. I know, but it doesn't make sense, I whispered back. We hurriedly exited the cabin and reconvened with Richie and Elliot outside, both of whom were startled by our wide-eyed terror upon exiting that godforsaken place. We have to leave now! I insisted on urgency in an effort not to alarm anyone. We decided that we'd pack up as quickly as possible first thing in the morning before heading back. That night was the longest one any of us had ever experienced. The darkness seemed thicker than usual, somehow rendering our surroundings practically invisible. Wind howling between the trees created an unsettling ambience as we lay inside our tents, unable to sleep. As morning broke, we began to pack, carrying heavy hearts burdened by that dreadful encounter, detailing more about what we had seen in the buildup of the cabin. Hastily breaking camp, we silently trudged back through the woods the way we came. However, true respite escaped us. The further away we moved from the cabin, it seemed those same deep gashes on tree trunks started appearing more frequently. Their mere presence stirred that growing sensation of dread in each one of us. Richie, who had been quiet all morning, spoke with a quivering voice. These gashes, they weren't here when we came in, were they? Ignoring his question, I pressed us forward, incessantly urging the group to quicken their pace through the undergrowth. Suddenly a horrible sound echoed throughout the forest, a blood-curdling scream mixed with a ghastly guttural roar. We froze in our tracks, every muscle in my body tense with dread as the unknown assailant approached closer toward us. We continued on, desperate to escape the ominous presence that seemed to stalk us through the forest. The horrible sounds wouldn't stop. It was as if whatever monstrous creature made them was closing in. We didn't dare look back, too afraid of what we might see. "'Guys, we have to call for help!' Richie insisted. No, let's not give away our position, I responded, afraid of attracting more attention from the unseen menace. We pressed on quicker now, with the sound still following us, further and further from anything familiar. Minutes turned into hours as we continued to run and intermittently walk while our breaths remained heavy and gasping. Eventually we found ourselves standing at the edge of a steep ravine. There was no easy way around it, and attempting to climb down would certainly result in serious injury or worse. We can't go this way, shouted Sarah, her voice breaking with panic. Then what do we do? demanded Richie. We're trapped. As if on cue, an ear-splitting growl filled the air behind us. With no other option left, I nervously looked over my shoulder. My eyes met something incredibly gruesome, a tall creature with skin stretched taut over its unnaturally slender frame. Its face appeared to be half human and half animal, with deep-set eyes that bore into me. Its strong arms were longer than anything humanly possible, ending in deadly claws that dripped with blood, seemingly from its previous victims or from mutilating tree trunks, maybe both. Those claws had most definitely left the gashes on the tree trunks that tormented us during our escape attempt. The creature let out another horrifying growl, followed by a guttural bellow as it edged closer to us. I'm calling for help! Richie cried out against my previous protests while he frantically dialed emergency services on his phone. Hello? Police! We need help! We're being attacked by something. We don't know what it is. But I knew that the police wouldn't arrive in time. The creature steadily advanced, its eyes never leaving ours. Jump! Sarah screamed. What? Richie hesitated, still on the call, 
but the fear and urgency in Sarah's eyes overcame his panic. I held on to my friends, one in each hand, as we leaped from the edge of the ravine. The grotesque creature roared upon realizing its potential prey had slipped from its grasp, at least momentarily. The fall would surely lead to grave consequences, but there was no other option. Either this or face the terrifying monster that had pursued us relentlessly throughout our nightmare. We tumbled downward, our screams piercing the air. Rocky surfaces scraped our skin as we hit branches and bushes in our descent. Our bodies crashed into one another repeatedly until, finally, agonizingly, we landed on the cold ground below. My vision blurred for a second before I regained consciousness. Pain flared throughout my body, but to my surprise I was relatively unharmed. Sarah lay beside me, bloodied and bruised but seemingly alive as well, barely conscious but breathing. Richie, however, did not fare so well. He slumped motionless against a large rock, blood pooling around his mangled form. It was clear that his injuries were fatal. He had taken the brunt of our dreadful fall. Sarah whimpered beside me as she realized Richie's fate. A thick silence enveloped us in our grief and pain until I heard distant sirens wailing into the woods above us. Desperate to make sure the creature wouldn't claim any more victims or return to finish what it started with Sarah and me, I urged her onto her feet despite her injuries. Come on, Sarah, I groaned through my pain. The police are coming. We have to make sure they don't face that thing alone. So we limped together toward the distant wailing sirens. Two survivors forever haunted by the agonizing memory of a friend lost to the terrifying monster in the trees and the nightmarish reminder that there are horrors in this world we may never understand. As rain poured down relentlessly, I stood drenched under the awning of a small gas station in the middle of nowhere, New Jersey. It was October 2017, and I could feel the cold autumn wind biting my bones, making me wish for a nice warm bed. A loud crack of thunder shook the air and I laughed nervously to myself. Great night for a road trip, huh? I muttered, attempting to lighten my own mood. No kidding, chimed in another voice, interrupting my thoughts. I turned to see an older man who looked just about as soaked and miserable as I did. His name was Stan Feldman, and we'd been talking inside while our cars filled up with gas. Our conversation continued as we shivered together in the cold. We shared trivial details of our lives before the topic shifted to local gossip. Stan had lived in these parts all his life and eagerly regaled me with a variety of tales about strange happenings in the area. But there's this one thing that's always bothered me, he said his voice taking on a new somber tone. There's a stretch of wood not far from here where folks say something ain't quite right. He went on to explain how people reported finding mutilated wildlife strewn around like confetti, as if something unseen had shredded them to bits. He then shared an even more disturbing tale, how every few years a group of locals would go missing in those same woods, only for pieces of their mangled remains to be discovered later. Caught up in Stan's stories and thankful for anything to distract me from the cold and the rain, I asked if he could show me the general vicinity of these incidents. Hesitating for a moment at my rather morbid curiosity, he finally agreed. We piled into my car and hit the road, following Stan's directions until we reached a narrow dirt path that led into the darkened woods. The rain had tapered to a fine mist, and though my head whispered caution, curiosity compelled me forward. Stan and I stepped out of the car, armed only with flashlights and our racing hearts. Shining the beams ahead of us, we cautiously made our way deeper into the forest. Dripping branches brushed against us as we carefully navigated the slippery, muddy ground. Under the weight of Stan's stories, it felt as if something malevolent hid in every shadow. Before long, we came upon a small clearing filled with eerie silence. The spaces between the leaves above us seemed to open up as if by invitation as if something unseen was bringing attention to itself. Stan's flashlight flickered across the treetops, illuminating an unusual bony structure in the branches. We exchanged unsettled glances before swinging our flashlights down to uncover a pile of oddly twisted bones, leaving us aghast. I didn't really believe it until I saw it myself, Stan stammered as we stared at the grisly sight. Forcibly willing my legs to move, I approached the tangled heap of bones. 
Struck by morbid fascination, I began examining them while Stan watched in muted apprehension. Among the remains lay parts of various animals. Claw marks and deep gashes bore evidence of what seemed an impossibly violent struggle. Without a word, I snapped a photo of the grisly scene with my phone, in case we'd need it later. Stan and I decided to leave the area, our hearts hammering in our chests as we speedily retraced our steps through the slippery ground. Though we still encountered the ominous shadows that seemed to follow us, we didn't know what or who was causing this horrifying sight that lay before us in the clearing. The first thing on our minds was to find help, but our cell service was virtually non-existent out here. We agreed it was best to get back to town and alert someone there immediately. Once we reached the outskirts of town, we split up with plans to meet at the diner once we found help. I went straight to the local police station while Stan headed back home to check if his family was safe. I burst through the doors of the police station and was met with skeptical stares from the officers behind their desks. I told them about what happened and showed them the gruesome photo on my phone. This is serious, said one officer after examining the picture. We'll gather a team and head back out into those woods right away. While waiting for the officers in their vehicles, I dialed Stan's number to update him on our situation. The call went straight to voicemail, leaving me feeling uneasy. Meanwhile, as Stan checked on his family, he noticed some blood droplets leading from his front door around to his garden shed. His heart sank with dread as he made his way towards it, only to find a monstrous creature feasting on one of his farm animals outside the shed. The abomination stood taller than any man three times over, its body covered with a mixture of fur and rotting flesh. It had long, clawed hands that hung nearly to its knees and seemed capable of ripping apart anything with ease. Its face resembled a bear and wolf combined, a snarling distortion of snout, teeth, and anger. Frozen in fear, Stan stared as it stood up on its hind legs, let out an ear-piercing scream, and charged towards him. Terrified and defenseless, Stan bolted from the scene and ran to the closest neighbor's house to seek help. Back at the police station, I became increasingly anxious as time continued to pass without any news from Stan. Suddenly my phone buzzed with a call. Panting and panicking, Stan relayed his encounter with the beast. The officers overheard our conversation and quickly gathered their weapons. Without wasting a second, their team piled into several police cars and rushed towards Stan's location. When we arrived at his neighbor's house, we could see that his family had already fled with the neighbors. Grateful for their safety but still on edge from what just happened, we started discussing the best course of action to put an end to these horrifying events. While the police began organizing search parties around town and in the woods nearby, it was evident they were struggling with handling something unknown like this creature. A citywide curfew was set, all hoping for some semblance of order during this chaos. A few officers patrolled the town each day while others prepared ambushes around Stan's property, knowing the creature had been there once before. Days turned into weeks as reports of strange sounds and disfigured animal corpses continued to pour in from outlying areas. Though no direct conflict with this terrifying creature occurred again for either myself or Stan in the following days, many in our community lost pets or livestock to its savage attacks. The scarier part? That sudden fateful evening brought forth an unending nightmare for our small town. We couldn't catch or stop this ruthless creature from murdering and mauling innocent animals every day that passed. Years would eventually pass by before attack reports finally began to wither, and the memory of our community's pain started to fade. But the beast never officially met its end, and neither did the scars it left on our town and the people who continue to live in constant fear of what's hiding among the shadows. I sprinted through the dense forest, sweat streaming down my face as I desperately tried to escape whatever was chasing me. Although it was only April of 2019, it felt like the longest day of my life. My heart pounded in my ears, drowning out any sound other than my gasping breaths and crunching footsteps. That morning, everything appeared normal. I was at my remote cabin in Tahuya State Forest for a weekend getaway from the city. The allure of nature had captivated me and I couldn't resist photographing the breathtaking surroundings. I had stumbled upon an unnerving spectacle just a few hours ago. Dozens of peculiar claw marks gouging into the bark of several trees, 
something far too large to be from any native animal. Trying to laugh it off, I told myself it was simply the work of some imaginative prankster, or perhaps one very territorial bear. As I ventured deeper into the forest, unease settled over me like a thick fog. Yet stubbornly, I refused to let irrational fear dictate my experience there. Along the way I spotted an old acquaintance named Jeremy perched atop a fallen log, scrutinizing his tattered map. "'Hey, Jeremy,' I called out as I approached. "'Need some help?' He glanced up and chuckled. "'You could say that. The forest is different this time, so easy to get lost.' he replied while shaking his head. "'You see those claw marks?' I inquired hesitantly. "'Yeah,' he answered with wide eyes. "'Rather worrisome.' We exchanged uneasy laughs and decided that sticking together might be best under these circumstances. Having a companion eased my anxiety, and before long, we found ourselves trading cheesy jokes. Jeremy was recounting a particularly terrible pun when suddenly we both froze upon hearing an unsettling growl echo through the trees around us. The air turned heavy with fear. Every instinct told us to run, and that's when I saw it. Emerging from the shadows was a horrifying creature, unlike anything I'd ever seen. It towered over us, nearly seven feet tall. Its mottled, charcoal-hued skin stretched tightly over its skeletal frame, and its elongated limbs ended in curved claws sharp enough to slice through steel. It moved with unnatural grace as it approached us, teeth bared in a sickening snarl. Jeremy screamed for help as the creature lunged at us, but I knew no one would hear us out here. We scattered in opposite directions, hoping at least one of us could escape. Now here I am, blindly running through the forest with my heart thundering painfully in my chest. Trees loomed overhead, casting sinister shadows that seemed to reach for me with spindly fingers. Fumbling with my pocket knife, I knew it wouldn't do much good against that monstrous thing, but any chance of survival was better than none. Darting around a massive oak tree, my foot caught on something hidden beneath the fallen leaves. I let out an involuntary scream as I pitched forward. Pain shot up my ankle. When I looked back to see what tripped me, dread washed over me like a tidal wave. The twisted remains of Jeremy lay sprawled out just a few feet away. Shredded bits of clothing clung to his mangled body. It took all my strength not to vomit at the grisly sight. Instead, I forced myself upright fighting through the nauseating agony coursing through my bruised and battered body. Ah. Limping forward with my injured ankle, I needed to call for help immediately. My hands trembled as I pulled out my phone, but there was no signal. Breathing heavily, I realized how deep into the forest we had run. Finding a spot to hide, I clutched the pocket knife in my hand. The monstrous being had long legs and arms that seemed to stretch beyond reason, covered with coarse black hair. Its face was twisted, a horrifying visage. Not quite human, but not entirely animal, either. Those golden eyes remained burned in my memory. They were so piercing and unnatural. I huddled against a tree trunk, listening for the slightest sound that could indicate whether or not it was nearby. A wretched stench wafted through the air. It was getting closer. Before I knew it, Sarah emerged from behind some bushes nearby, gasping for breath and visibly shaking. "'Oh, God! What happened to Jeremy?' She cried out, Sarah! My voice broke as relief washed over me briefly. We need to get out of here now! I didn't have time to explain. Each moment wasted amplified the risk of us being caught by the monster that chased us relentlessly through the forest. What is that thing? Sarah whispered as we struggled through the underbrush together. I don't know, I replied honestly. All I knew was that it had killed Jeremy, and I wanted to do the same to us. Continuing to move slowly due to my injury, we tried our best to put as much distance between us and the monster as possible. But its pursuit was relentless. The loathing and malevolence behind its golden eyes fueled its determination. Sarah's screams shattered my focus when she suddenly disappeared, taken by that inhuman creature. Trying to save her from its grip, I slashed at its long arm with my pocket knife. It grunted in pain and hurled her away. We made our escape as the creature nursed its wound. Exhaustion threatened to overtake us, but there was no time to stop. I knew that once it recovered, it would undoubtedly come after us again. After what felt like an eternity, we came across a road. A passerby noticed our desperation and stopped, offering us assistance. Grateful for any help, we quickly climbed into the stranger's car. 
We were attacked by something. I don't know what it was, Sarah exclaimed while catching her breath. Tears streamed down her face as she recalled Jeremy's fate. The driver furrowed his brow in confusion, but agreed to take us straight to the nearest town. On the way there, we contacted the police about the monster. They listened to our story with skepticism, yet assured us they would investigate cautiously. The police returned empty-handed. It seemed that the creature had vanished without a trace. Nothing remained of Jeremy except for the gruesome scene that haunted our memories. As Sarah and I tried to move forward, we knew that somewhere out there, that monstrous being was still stalking in the shadows. Time would heal our wounds, but its memory would haunt us forever. A reminder to stay vigilant against the unknown horrors lurking in the depths of the wilderness. Despite our ordeal, one truth became abundantly clear. Life is fragile, and can change in an instant when faced with something beyond our understanding or control. The only thing left for us is survival, keeping alive through those challenges, no matter how terrifying they may seem. As I lifted the heavy box out of my trunk, I felt the sweat trickle down my back and soak into my shirt. It was a muggy August evening, and I had just moved into my new cottage near a small, quiet town in Pennsylvania. My decision to leave the noisy city was a foolish bet with my co-workers that country life would be more peaceful. That bet would soon haunt me. I hauled the box inside, cider in hand as a reward for my efforts, and began to unpack my belongings. After painstaking labor, I placed the last dish in its rightful cabinet. Just as I was about to relax, an unsettling metallic clanging broke the silence of the night. Confused and annoyed, I stepped onto the front porch. The neighbor's picket fence gate was swinging wildly on its hinges, as if it had been violently pushed open. I figured it must have been some wild animal raiding their trash, not much of a problem if it could be contained. I decided to walk over in the morning and introduce myself to my neighbors, Anna and Perry Mitchell, offer help if needed, or just give them a heads up about their trash. Maybe they would even laugh it off as an initiation rite for me, the new guy from the city. Anna welcomed me into her bright yellow kitchen with warm biscuits and tea. We had our small talk, and I mentioned my new plan for closing their gate at night and placing something heavy in front of it. Perry, however, didn't look amused at all when Anna relayed his suggestion, instead frowning deeply. They say things wander in these woods, he murmured gravely. No use in barricading gates. I tried to contain any snickers or disbelief. After all, rural houses with extensive grounds have their own tall tales. All right then, I chuckled nervously, suddenly uncomfortable. As days went by, this quiet existence was unexpectedly perfect. The bright green leaves of the trees formed a giant canopy over smooth, nearly untraveled roads. I began to notice something strange in the evenings, though. Those odd clangs from the Mitchell's yard were happening more frequently sometimes accompanied by distant scuffling noises that didn't sound like any animal I'd ever heard. One particularly cloudy day, they came to call on me, both visibly shaken and pale. Through gritted teeth and hushed whispers, Anna explained that their dog, Barkley, had vanished under mysterious circumstances. Perry explained how he had found a few unsettling chopped strands of fur on their patio during his search. There was absolutely no sign of blood anywhere, Determined to do something about these increasingly bizarre occurrences, I convinced Perry to search the woods with me the following night. I assumed it'd be best if we went armed, just in case, so we each grabbed a flashlight and a large carving knife from my kitchen collection. Feeling like characters in a true crime novel, we ventured through the murky darkness of the forest and eventually stumbled upon a trail of torn-up bushes, as if something massive tried to pass through in a hurry. We exchanged nervous glances and took a step forward when suddenly... A colossal force knocked Perry off his feet, launching him several yards away. I froze in terror as this unholy beast lumbered out from behind the foliage. Something from my darkest nightmares stood before me. Built like an overly muscled panther with sickeningly elongated limbs that twisted in unnatural angles, its face was disturbingly human yet distorted beyond comprehension. Its eyes burned hatred into my very soul as it snarled at me with jagged teeth that dripped with rancid drool. With no time to consider any other options, I yelled at Perry to find cover while I distracted the creature. I threw rocks at it, 
hoping to buy some time for Perry to recover from the impact and get his bearings. The beast's gaze shifted towards me, and it mirrored my actions by throwing a nearby piece of wood with such force that it broke on impact against a nearby tree trunk. Perry and I exchanged a look that communicated our mutual understanding. Escape was our only option. We sprinted away from the creature as it gave chase, hearing its guttural growls and snapping branches in hot pursuit behind us. As we ran, I realized that we couldn't simply outrun this monster. We needed outside help. In the chaos of the moment, using our cell phones wasn't feasible. We'd lose precious seconds of escape trying to reach anyone, assuming we could even receive a signal in this dense forest. Instead, we decided that one of us would break away from the chase to reach safety and call for help. I signaled to Perry which direction he should take as we came upon a fork in the path. As my friend vanished in one direction, the creature continued its pursuit after me. My limbs ached from exertion and my lungs burned for air, but I refused to submit out of a pure instinctual drive for survival. The beast was relentless in its pursuit, growling and swiping at me with its dangerous claws. One swipe narrowly missed my head. Suddenly a loud bang echoed through the night. In an instant the creature halted its chase of me, turning towards the source of the noise with curiosity and annoyance. Seizing my chance, I crawled behind a large tree trunk to catch my breath and observe what was happening. A group of local hunters had heard the commotion and now stood armed before the vicious beast. Guns aimed at it as they cautiously approached. Their additional number seemed to be enough to intimidate the creature, as it feigned a retreat before suddenly making its lunge toward the hunters. Shots rang out, but the bullets only seemed to graze the creature's thick hide. Amidst the chaos, I managed to crawl closer to one of the hunters and tell him about Perry, that they needed to find him as soon as possible. They were hesitant at first, but after witnessing the terrifying might of this beast, they had no choice but to believe me. Leaving a few hunters behind to continue their confrontation with the creature, a smaller group headed in Perry's direction. Seconds turned into minutes as I awaited news on Perry's condition, my heart pounding in my chest. The remaining hunters continued their fighting with the creature until, suddenly and without warning, it disappeared into the forest as mysteriously as it had appeared. Its retreat left us all with more questions than answers. Finally, one of the hunters returned with Perry in tow, bloody and bruised, but fortunately not fatally injured. We clung to each other in relief, knowing how close we were to meeting our end here. In the days that followed, local law enforcement remained tight-lipped about the incident. They likely wanted to avoid stirring up panic among residents. We never heard anything more about that hellish creature, nor did it show any signs of returning. Despite our best efforts to return to a sense of normalcy after what we experienced together, our friendship with Perry wasn't quite the same. We each were haunted by our harrowing memories, but each day cheered by our mortal bonds would remind us that together we had faced an unspeakable horror in these woods and survived against all odds. It was supposed to be a refreshing break from city life as I set out for an extended weekend in a small forested town somewhere in Oregon during the quiet month of September. I had heard nothing but enchanting reviews of the place from some acquaintances, so when I finally arrived, the calming aura surrounding me instantly wiped away all thoughts of fatigue or stress. The first few days of my stay proved uneventful, yet soothing. I spent most of my time enjoying nature walks, hiking, and just basking in the serenity while sampling the local cuisine. It wasn't until the fourth day that things began to unravel in ways that still haunt me. I had embarked on a solo hiking adventure that afternoon and was making my way through lush greenery, snapping photos along the way. That's when I found it, a peculiar heap of tattered clothing surrounded by a pool of coagulated blood and bones that had been picked clean. It seemed like something had ravaged the person who once wore those clothes complete carnage. Alarmed and puzzled at such an atrocious sight, I attempted to dial the local police but noticed that my cell reception was non-existent. Feeling sickened and uncertain about what kind of wild animal could have caused this gruesome scene, I decided to retreat back to town and report the grisly discovery. I rapidly hiked back toward town and notified the authorities, and while they took the situation seriously, there wasn't much they could do given how little evidence remained. 
With nobody else having encountered strange animal attacks like this before or being aware of previous mysterious disappearances, they agreed to keep an eye on things with extra nightly patrols. That night, right after turning off my bedside lamp for some much-needed rest, a low growl outside my window caught my attention. Though scared stiff by curiosity, I peered out only to notice an enormous creature lurking among the bushes. It was not entirely visible thanks to the curtain of leaves surrounding it, but from what I could make out, its body seemed distorted and incredibly large for any known animal species. Its eyes, a chilling shade of red, sent cold shivers down my spine. Before I could get a better look, the vicious monster lunged gracefully into the shadows, leaving me to question if what I just saw was real or a trick of my anxious mind. Afraid to sleep and unable to contact the police, I decided the best course of action was to barricade myself inside my cabin for the night. The next day I sought out Bernard, a seasoned local hunter that I had become friends with during my stay. He cautiously listened as I recounted my spine-chilling encounter. He told me that he had never heard any similar stories in this town before, but promised to keep watch for any signs of strange occurrences. That evening, as I turned down Bernard's invitation for an outdoor drink by his porch, staying indoors seemed like a good choice given the previous night's events. It was just around midnight when Bernard suddenly summoned me on the two-way radio he had given me earlier, his voice quivering with urgency. Come, quick, he stammered and paused momentarily, trying to catch his breath. I saw something. You gotta see this. The urgency in his voice spurred me into action, despite my reservations about venturing out after dark. As I furiously picked up my flashlight and put on shoes for any necessary sprinting, Bernard's voice returned over the radio. Hurry, the creature! It's... it's not alone. I raced out of my cabin, heart pounding in my chest, as I made my way towards Bernard's house through the darkness. The urgency in his voice on the radio filled me with a sense of dread that I hadn't experienced since my own encounter with the unexplainable creature. As I approached Bernard's house, I saw him by his front door clutching his rifle tightly. His face was pale with terror. What is it? What did you see? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. They're out there, multiple creatures, beyond anything I've seen before, he whispered. I could hear scratching and growling noises coming from the dense woods surrounding us. Sweat streamed down my face, though I knew I needed to remain calm. Should we call for help? The police, maybe? Bernard shook his head sharply. No time. We need to protect ourselves and get away from here. We wouldn't even know what to tell them. As we cautiously backed away from his porch, the creatures edged closer. Their grotesque forms emerged from the darkness, advancing upon us with menacing intent. They stood on two legs but had twisted bodies covered in matted fur, serrated claws gleaming in the moonlight, and rows of sharp teeth visible in their snarls. One of the beasts lunged at me, and I fell backward as its claws tore into my arm. Pain seared through me as blood oozed from the wound. Bernard fired a shot at it, and it emitted a high-pitched howl before retreating into the shadows. Run! Bernard shouted at me as another creature charged toward us. Heart racing and vision blurred from pain, I sprinted alongside Bernard as we made our way through the dark forest. The creatures pursued us relentlessly, snapping at our heels with each stride. As we entered a clearing near a riverbed, one of the creatures charged at Bernard, knocking him to the ground with force as it tore into his leg with its teeth. He cried out in agony and a mixture of fear and anger overcame me as I grabbed a large rock from the edge of the river. With all my strength, I swung the rock at the beast's head, crushing its skull. It crumpled lifelessly to the ground, but more creatures were already lunging at us. We have to go! Cross the river! Bernard gasped through gritted teeth. I helped him onto his good leg and supported him as we stumbled towards the water. The icy current bit at our exposed skin, and we struggled against it as we made our way across. The creatures slowed their pursuit near the water's edge but didn't follow us into the river. Reaching the other side, soaked and shivering from both cold and fear, we dragged ourselves away from the riverbank. We took advantage of the creature's hesitation to cross the water and put some distance between ourselves and our attackers. We finally found refuge in an abandoned cabin that had been long forgotten by its previous owners. Exhausted and wounded both in body and spirit, we collapsed on its dusty floor. I inspected Bernard's wound. He had lost a lot of blood. 
We urgently needed medical care, but calling for help was not an option until daylight. At least we were alive, for now, but our encounter with these vile predators would forever haunt us. As day broke and sunlight seeped through the cracks in our temporary sanctuary, I risked using my two-way radio to call for help, while Bernard remained inside to nurse his wounds. Soon enough, we were taken by ambulance to a local hospital for treatment. In hushed whispers filled with regret and grief, Bernard told me of his fallen friends who hadn't been so lucky when they encountered similar creatures, friends we would never forget. Years later, I would find myself reminiscing about that fateful night and the horrifying circumstances that brought Bernard and me together. As for the creatures, whatever they were, I resolutely avoided venturing into those woods after dark. I'll never know what the creatures were, nor will I ever understand why they targeted us. But one thing was certain. I would never be the same person again after going through such a harrowing experience with such nightmarish beings. An unmistakable crack of a branch echoed through the night, jolting me from my nightly walk in the Huckleberry Swamp nature area in Connecticut. My heart pounded fiercely as I frantically turned around, straining my eyes to penetrate the dense foliage. The moon had hidden behind thick clouds, darkening the forest even more. My two friends, Marcella Quinn and Tyrese Hillman, shared uneasy glances with me. Just earlier that month, an experienced hiker had disappeared in this very forest without a trace. Determined not to lose our nerve, we decided to stay close together and head back towards the trail that led to our vehicle. As we picked up our pace, Tyrese picked up an asymmetrical stick and began swinging it around playfully. How many squirrels do you think will take this as a threat? He joked to lighten the mood. I managed to chuckle but couldn't ignore the overwhelming dread seeping into my bones. Despite trying to stay logical and focused on avoiding tree roots underfoot, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The splashing sound of footsteps in shallow water reached our ears, causing us all to stop and listen attentively. They were too heavy and deliberate for animals as conspicuous as deer or raccoons. "'Who's there?' Marcella called out nervously, her voice louder than she probably intended. The relentless footfalls ceased momentarily before resuming with renewed purpose. Whatever it was seemed intent on moving towards us. We bolted unceremoniously through snags and tangled underbrush, until Marcella tripped over a protruding root, whimpering in pain as she clutched her ankle. Her fall had revealed more than just her injury. Inches from where she lay was a weathered shoe, and next to that lay bits of torn clothing stained with dried blood, as if clawed apart by a ferocious beast. "'Come on, we need to get you out of here,' Tyrese said shakily, helping Marcella up despite her protests. I sensed the urgency disguised beneath his calm exterior, and the desperate need to flee this seemingly cursed natural area surged through me. As we half limped and half hobbled forward in a makeshift formation, I observed that the relentless footsteps had now been joined by low growls, emitting an air of predatory intelligence that suggested it was not an ordinary animal pursuing us. Desperate whispers slid through the trees as a sour stench filled my nostrils. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted something otherworldly, a grotesque creature with mottled fur clung to a nearby tree trunk. Its elongated limbs appeared capable of snapping bones effortlessly, and its claws were viciously sharp. Its eyes were like cold pools of inky darkness swirling with malicious intent. All semblance of hope was quickly vanishing, as I knew that any attempt to evade our fate would only prolong the inevitable. The ominous figure slithered through the forest faster than any known animal could reasonably accomplish. Suddenly, Tyrese acted on pure instinct and tossed his stick toward the creature as he pushed Marcella and me behind him. "'Get back!' he warned, racking his mind for an escape plan as the imposing beast twisted and scowled menacingly at its unexpected prey. Panic surged through Marcella as she gripped her injured ankle tightly and whispered through gritted teeth, "'We can't outrun it!' Realizing the futility of trying to outrun the creature, I turned my focus to finding some form of help." Somewhere we could take refuge from this nightmarish beast. Tyrese! Marcella! I shouted above the panicked gasps of my friends. There's a police station about half a mile away. If we can make it there, maybe they can help us. Tyrese nodded in agreement, assisting a limping Marcella as we hobbled down the forest path toward the faint glow of streetlights in the distance. 
The creature snarled and lunged forward, but it seemed unwilling or unable to stray too far from its forest domain. As we neared the edge of the woods, our hearts pounded, and adrenaline coursed through our veins. The sudden respite from our pursuer's relentless pursuit was an unexpected but welcome reprieve. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we stumbled out onto the street and began to run towards the police station. Tyrese continued to support Marcella as we bolted down the dimly lit streets, desperate for salvation. The cold wind stung our faces as we reached the front door of the station and pounded on it with urgency. An officer quickly opened it and stared at us with noticeable concern at our disheveled appearances. Help us! There's some... something after us! I managed to blurt it out through heavy breaths. The officer immediately ushered us inside, securing the door behind him. As we sank into chairs in their waiting area, trying to catch our breaths, fear still gripped me tightly. I couldn't help but notice that although the creature had not dared leave its wooded lair back there, it had managed to come closer than ever before. As soon as he joined a few of his colleagues near us, I explained what had happened, how we were terrorized unceasingly in the woods by an unknown entity resembling no earthly creature. My voice was shaky, and my eyes darted to every corner of the room, searching for any sign of danger. Worried for our safety, the officer assigned two armed guards to barricade the entrance to the police station. They had no clue what they were up against, but their readiness showed they were prepared to protect us at all costs. Suddenly, chaos erupted outside. A guttural scream echoed through the night as shots rang out. The officers hurriedly locked down the station. We huddled together, trying not to think about what could be happening outside, our minds racing with terrifying thoughts. The officers outside eventually managed to retreat back into the building, their faces pale and panic-stricken. One of them had been mauled by the creature, their arm was severely injured, but thankfully they were still alive. Despite their efforts, however, we were far from safe. It was clear that whatever was hunting us would not be easily deterred. We needed to get as far away from this nightmare as possible before it claimed more victims. With Marcella's ankle bandaged and accompanied by a group of heavily armed officers, we piled into a vehicle and sped away from the scene, hoping we had seen the last of whatever sinister force pursued us. Days passed without incident. While we couldn't erase the memory of what transpired in those woods, and Marcella's scarred ankle would always serve as a grim reminder of that night, some semblance of normalcy began to return to our lives. Months turned into years as we did our best to put that horrifying ordeal behind us. Tyrese and I often sat together, reflecting on that gruesome monster that changed our lives forever, and remembering that brave officer who suffered a significant injury for our safety that day. As I looked back on those dark moments, I still couldn't comprehend why or how such an abomination existed in this world. All I knew was that, whatever it was, I hoped we would never have to encounter it again. I was getting ready to leave the office for the night when my phone started buzzing. My best friend, Hank, sent me a voice message. He sounded tense. Hey man, I just found something really weird out here at the Buckner Forest Preserve in Illinois. The police don't believe me and think it's a prank, but this is messed up. I need your help, he said urgently. I sighed and called Hank back. All right, so what's going on? Well, I came out here for a hike. You know how I like to unwind after work, but... His voice trailed off hesitantly before he continued. I stumbled upon... a body. My stomach churned at the thought. A dead body? Yeah! There's no way an animal did this. It looks... intentional. Call the police, Hank. I already did, he said defensively. They told me it was a sick joke and hung up on me. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I agreed to meet him there. As I drove to the forest preserve, I couldn't shake the unease settling in my chest. The sun was slipping away when I finally reached Hank. He led me through thickets, moving further away from the marked trails. Watch your step, he warned as we approached the gruesome discovery. The body was utterly mutilated and twisted beyond recognition. The skin shredded apart so that muscle and sinew were woven into the gnarled branches of nearby trees. My whole being shook at the horrific sight. 
What could have done this? I whispered. Hank shook his head solemnly. I've never seen anything like this before. We decided to take matters into our own hands and search for clues about what happened. The more we uncovered claw marks on trees and tracks, unlike any animal print I had ever seen, the more unnerved we became. As night fell, we built a fire and attempted to make sense of the situation. Hank told an inappropriate joke that made me chuckle despite the gravity of it all. I don't know how you can do that, man, I commented, forcing a smile. He shrugged. What else can I do? Gotta find some way to cope. A sudden snapping sound pierced the silence, causing us to jump. A low growl rumbled in the distance. As we frantically doused our fire and prepared ourselves for whatever was coming, the growl intensified, and a hulking figure lumbered out of the darkness. It towered over us. It looked barely human, with elongated limbs covered in matted fur and eyes that shimmered with malice. The air was heavy with the scent of rot. It stared at us for what felt like an eternity before lunging forward with incredible speed. We dodged its attack in a panic as it tore through saplings and shrubs without any resistance. Hank grabbed a fallen branch like a baseball bat as we tried to fend off this formidable beast. With each swing, I glimpsed its wicked claws reflecting the moonlight, sharp as knives and stained red. It was relentless, deflecting blows from Hank's makeshift weapon as though they were nothing while lunging and snarling at us menacingly. Our breaths were ragged, and our fear was palpable as we continued to narrowly sidestep its attacks. The beast's relentless pursuit continued as we sprinted through the woods, desperately trying to put distance between ourselves and the monstrous pursuer. I considered calling for help, but quickly realized we were too far into the woods for anyone to hear us, and there was no cell reception in this area to reach 911. Besides, would anyone even believe us if we described what we were being chased by? Hank landed a hit with his makeshift bat, knocking the creature off balance momentarily, but it quickly recovered and continued its pursuit with renewed ferocity. Not far from us, Sarah stumbled and fell. Panic rose within me as I saw her struggling to regain her footing. Time slowed down as I noticed the creature pounce on Sarah, its razor-sharp claws slashing her flesh. I stood paralyzed with fear as Hank valiantly stepped in between the creature and Sarah, attempting to fend off the attacks using his branch. Unable to turn away from Sarah, he received a vicious swipe to the face, which left deep gashes streaming with blood. The pain brought him to his knees, but he managed to buy enough time for Sarah to scramble back onto her feet. She looked at me, terror etched in her eyes as she grasped onto my arm tightly, pulling me along as we both sprinted away from Hank and the monstrous figure. I couldn't stop thinking about our injured friend left behind. As we made our escape, I heard agonizing cries erupting from behind us. Hank's pained screams, followed by the guttural growls of the creature. Our only choice was to keep running with all our might so that we wouldn't be next. Eventually, Sarah tripped over a fallen log as exhaustion overwhelmed her. We found ourselves cornered against a massive rock formation with no escape route in sight. The sinister figure emerged from the shadows once again, this time seemingly even more enraged. It stared us down and prepared us to pounce, but just as it was about to strike, a gunshot rang out through the woods. The creature faltered, momentarily disoriented by the noise. Seizing the opportunity, an elderly man suddenly appeared, wielding a shotgun and pointing it directly at the creature. Get out of here! Go now! He shouted at us. Not needing any more encouragement, Sarah and I quickly picked ourselves up and fled the scene, following the stranger's pointing finger toward what appeared to be a path. We didn't stop running until we reached the safety of the nearest town, where we managed to contact the local authorities. Though we tried our best to explain the situation and give them Hank's general location in the woods, skepticism clouded their faces as they exchanged glances. How could they possibly comprehend our unimaginably horrifying night? Despite their doubts, they formed search parties with armed officers and ventured into the woods in search of Hank and our unknown savior. Hours later, they returned with grim news. They discovered Hank's mutilated body strewn across the forest floor along with those of others, all victims of a similar fate. There was no sign of our elderly rescuer or the mysterious creature that had tormented us relentlessly. For days after our ordeal, Sarah and I were haunted by the deaths of not only Hank, 
but also other unknown victims found in that nightmarish forest. We couldn't wrap our heads around what motivated such a horrific being and what it truly was. No words could describe our gratitude for that brave old man who risked his life to deter the creature and save us. We'll always honor his memory alongside those who met untimely ends in those ominous woods. One frosty morning as dew still clung to the grass, I decided to explore the dense woods surrounding my grandparents' cabin in Idaho. Their secluded retreat had always captured my curiosity, and I resolved to venture out and discover some of its secrets. As I laced up my boots and grabbed a backpack filled with supplies, I knew I was ill-prepared for the challenge. My usual city attire was a stark contrast to the rugged environment that lay ahead, a fact that became painfully apparent by mid-afternoon. The area remained unfamiliar, and the further I trekked, the more twisted the towering trees appeared. The sun was descending swiftly when I stumbled across an old, rusting trap at the foot of an imposing oak. It lay open and snapped tightly shut, clearly successful in violently enfolding its prey sometime in the not-so-distant past. The grotesque scene before me featured an abundance of fresh blood splatters on nearby leaves and crimson footprints fading into slushy brown stains in the soil. Mortified yet intrigued, I continued deeper into the forest, navigating lavish foliage and concealed pitfalls. As time wore on, hushed whispers gradually seeped through the dimming air. Don't stay too long. You know what happens when night falls. My playful response echoed in contrast with their genuine angst. Bad things happen in threes. I retorted to their valid concerns. An inexplicable sense of being watched began to creep over me. It felt as though something massive and malevolent lurked just outside of my peripheral vision. The further I ventured into these mysterious woods, the more convinced I became that something otherworldly, an entity both terrifyingly beautiful yet gut-wrenchingly repulsive, scared me from a distance. I came across a dingy clearing near sunset. It revealed several shallow pits teeming with decaying organic matter that blanketed what could potentially be lifeless bodies. The pungent stench was enough to make the eyes water and the stomachs lurch. Uttering a quippy remark amid my rising panic, I clung to the hope that these dark discoveries would not foreshadow some untimely fate. The worst is over. You can't have a comedy trilogy without comedic relief. I grinned through the fear to keep myself from shattering. The air grew colder as darkness enveloped the forest, while an eerie stillness held my surroundings in its suffocating grip. A sudden high-pitched scream echoed throughout the seemingly endless trees, ripping through the silence and sending me sprinting blindly with anxiety pulsating through every fiber of my being. In my adrenaline-fueled haste, I tripped over exposed roots and plunged to the forest floor as another blood-curdling screech filled the air. When I dared to raise my head, what I saw boggled my mind. An indeterminate creature loomed before me its grotesque features illuminated by the faint glow of moonlight seeping through twisted branches. Unable to identify this monstrous being, I froze, terrified that any movement might incite it to strike. I attempted to assess this shocking adversary. Its gargantuan frame was marked by mangled fur coated in sanguine stains and slick fluids. Rows of razor-sharp teeth jutted from its immense maw, while obsidian eyes burrowed through me like scalding blades. As it stalked towards me, a swirling concoction of dread and revulsion bubbled within my chest. Instinct screamed for me to flee, while logic howled about facing certain doom if I dared engage in such an abomination. Clinging to some fleeting shard of bravado while plagued with horror-induced tremors, I managed a jest at this harrowing juncture. Looks like we've entered Act 3, plot twist galore. In the split second it took for me to glance away, the creature vanished. The realization that this monstrosity possessed ingenuity beyond human comprehension rapidly solidified. Gathering myself, I scrambled to my feet and stumbled onwards, the grip of fear never loosening. As I desperately sprinted through the oppressive darkness, I wondered how, or if, I would escape this living nightmare. Anxiety tinged with mad humor intertwined like venomous vines, weighing down each frantic step. I looked back, thinking instinctively to call my friend Sarah for help, 
but quickly remembered she had been a victim of this terrifying creature just the day before. Tears formed in my eyes, but I couldn't dwell on the past. I had to act now. Continuing the seemingly endless chase, I felt exhaustion pull at my limbs. A dull ache settled into my bones. The overwhelming desire to just give up and let fate decide gnawed at my willpower. But I remembered Sarah lying there, ravaged, her face twisted in unbearable pain and losing her battle with life. I couldn't let her death be in vain, so I strengthened my resolve and ran harder. At last, I stumbled upon a small cluster of houses along an unpaved dirt road. Desperate for help, I urged my legs to carry me toward the first house with lights on. Banging on the door with heavy breaths escaping from my throat, a middle-aged woman cautiously opened it. Please, help! I gasped out between racked breaths. There's this creature out attacking everyone! You have to call the police! Hearing the distress in my voice now mixed with echoes of anguished cries from other victims carried by soft whispers of wind, she let me in without hesitation and immediately called 911. As we waited for the police to arrive, the screams faded into eerie silence, unease seeping through every crack and crevice of that small dwelling. The once comforting ambiance morphed into an oppressive atmosphere weighed down by dread. Doubt started to gnaw at me as minutes turned into hours. Without any noise from outside and having never faced anything like this before, would they even believe us? Would they think it's some prank or delusion? Finally, we heard a knock at the door. My heart leaped with hope that maybe this was finally the end, that perhaps the police had somehow defeated the monstrous being and we could move forward from this dark chapter in our lives. The officers took our statements, their expressions grim and unyielding. The woman sobbed uncontrollably as she recounted her neighbor's blood-curdling screams. The image of my friend Sarah, barely recognizable after her own encounter with the skinwalker, was etched into my memory forever. Over the following days, the police searched for answers while carefully avoiding any mention of the supernatural. They understood that something inexplicable had occurred, but were hesitant to engage in conjecture that would ridicule them in the small community. I laid low during those tumultuous times, knowing I wasn't capable of confronting the predator that had claimed lives and induced terror with surgical precision. It stalked us all mercilessly, tormenting some victims by mutilating them beyond recognition while leaving others physically unscathed but irreparably scarred. As the bodies continued to pile up, a chilling realization gripped us. The beast was always one step ahead. No matter how many officers patrolled or how many precautions we took, it would find a way to prey on us without being caught. Weeks later, the attack suddenly ceased, leaving a thick fog of uncertainty in their wake. We eventually learned that another small town miles away became its new hunting ground. Somehow, the creature had moved on without detection, shattering every hope that it could be captured or stopped. The devastation left behind was palpable, as our already fractured lives became steeped in sorrow and despair. The horrifying events clung to our beings like rotten carcasses, haunting remnants of a life stripped from us as witnesses to such unfathomable cruelty. But through this grief-stricken hellscape emerged a new determination, to survive and reclaim our world, ravaged by an unimaginably sinister force. Remembrance for those lost, including my dear friend Sarah, fueled our inner fire to push forward, refusing to fade away under the shadow of this vile, relentless creature. Time passed, wounds healed, and the memories of that horrifying chapter in our lives clawed at us with weakened fervor. The pain from the past would never truly fade, but perhaps it made us resilient in an unforgiving world where ancient predators slither through shadows, stalking mankind's very existence. <laughs>